October of 1942 found the war in the Pacific still hanging in the balance. The great wave of early Japanese expansion had broken upon the dogged and skillful Australian defence at Milne Bay and along the Kokoda Track, and the United States Marines had begun the first major Allied counter-offensive at Guadalcanal. Nevertheless, the tide had certainly not yet turned. After securing a foothold at Henderson Field, the Americans had held off a ferocious series of Japanese attacks, and two months later, the wider Battle of Guadalcanal had still not yet been decided. Despite the defeat at Midway, the Japanese still enjoyed naval superiority, and the Allies could not maintain sea control around the island. With desperate naval combat raging in Iron Bottom Sound, the American position at Henderson Field was constantly under threat of naval isolation. Although the lead elements of the Americal Division were beginning to land in early October, the Marines were still desperately holding on, and it was only through their determination that the position on the island had been held at all. In Southwest Pacific Area commands, the Allies were, finally, in a position to begin the first offensive operations in Papua or New Guinea. MacArthur had been anxious to attack, but throughout the majority of 1942, the Allies had been forced to react to simultaneous Japanese offensives. After the devastating defeat at Midway, the Japanese had altered their operational plans in the South Pacific, abandoning the idea of taking Fiji and Samoa and focusing their attention on the capture of the last major forward Allied airbase in the theatre, Port Moresby. In July and August, they launched a major coordinated offensive in Papua. Reinforced by the 41st Regiment, the South Seas Detachment had landed at Buna and began advancing over the Kokoda Track, across the fearsome Owen Stanley Mountains, towards Port Moresby. Simultaneously, Japanese Marines began landing in the area surrounding the Allied airbase at Milne Bay. In a little more than a week of fighting, the Japanese were decisively defeated around Milne Bay, suffering nearly 100% casualties, including those who were sick and suffering from battle fatigue. The operations across the Kokoda Track, however, had been some of the most gruelling fighting anywhere in World War II. After a month-long fighting retreat, the outnumbered Australians had drawn the Japanese deep into the mountains where they began to starve. With the bitter, two-week-long battle of 2nd Templeton's Crossing, Eora Creek, the Australians had driven the Japanese from the mountains. On the 4th of November, the 7th Division had retaken Kokoda, and a week later, the Australians had decisively defeated the South Seas Detachment at the Battle of Oivi. The great Japanese advance across the Kokoda Track had ended in disaster, and now, with the airfield at Kokoda secured, the Australians had a firm logistical base on the north side of the towering Owen Stanley Mountains, enabling them to support the operations of a whole division. Thus, the time for the belated Allied offensive appeared to be at hand, but the Japanese were hardly on the back foot. MacArthur faced a complex operational environment. In simple terms, Papua is cut in half by the great wilderness of the Owen Stanley Mountains. The north and south coasts are effectively islands, only accessible by sea or air. The Allies held the south coast through to Milne Bay. The Japanese dominated the north coast from their bases at Salamaua and Leh, through to the Bunagona area, the staging area for the Kokoda Offensive. Thus, any offensive was always limited by the available logistical assets, particularly aircraft, and throughout 1942 the Japanese held substantial naval superiority in the area. Large amphibious operations would not be possible until 1943. So, although MacArthur had very large land forces available in Australia, roughly half a million men, these could not be deployed to the Papuan battlefields without supporting logistical assets. Additionally, the Japanese still had substantial formations in the Philippines and Rabaul that could be committed to Papua to counter any major Allied blow. The Allies did hold one substantial advantage in Papua, air power. The United States Army Air Corps 5th Air Force and Royal Australian Air Force were growing in strength by the week. Although slow compared to Europe, the flow of new aircraft from Australia, the United States and Britain was continually shifting the air balance in Papua towards the Allies with Japanese production simply unable to keep pace. From mid-1942, the Japanese had been drawn into nearly daily air battle with Australian and American fighters, and the attritional losses could not be sustained. Compounding the lack of aircraft was the increasing quality of the Allies. It was, perhaps, in the area of air power that the two Allies most successfully integrated, as the 5th Air Force and the RAAF were quickly forming one coherent fighting force. 
In actions such as the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, Australian and American squadrons would show just how lethal an airborne fighting force the Allies had forged. With well-trained pilots flying increasingly more modern aircraft, the Allied air forces were beginning to gain the ascendancy in Papua. Perhaps the most important was the increasing numbers of C-47 transport aircraft, which were critical in sustaining Allied operations on the north coast of Papua and into New Guinea. As the battle in and around Guadalcanal continued to draw Japanese forces out of the Southwest Pacific theater, it was clear that there was now a real opportunity for a major offensive in Papua. MacArthur had not performed well throughout 1942. Despite the pageantry surrounding his departure, the Philippines campaign had hardly been a crowning moment of glory, and his command of Australian forces during the Battle of Milne Bay and along the Kokoda Track had been poor. All throughout this period, MacArthur and his staff were completely disconnected from actual conditions on the ground, ordering attacks and advances despite the impossibility of these maneuvers. Worse was the continual meddling and micromanagement of Australian subordinates, which had a demonstrably negative impact on Australian command. MacArthur had shown himself to be a poor defensive general. Prone to anxiety when a battle was not going to plan, he lacked the flexibility, adaptability and cool temperament required to fight a defensive battle well especially in 1942. Nevertheless, with the onset of offensive operations, the war was now entering a phase which far more suited his strengths. As opposed to later operations in New Guinea, which were generally planned by Australian generals, the November offensive was directly the product of MacArthur and GHQ. As was typical of MacArthur, the plan was good. The objective was the most exposed Japanese base at Gona and Buna. This had been the area where the Japanese had begun the Kokoda Track Offensive, and its capture would effectively mean the encirclement of the Japanese forces which had fought in Kokoda, the elite South Seas Detachment. The primary objective of MacArthur's operational plan was to strike the base with simultaneous attacks from three separate axes. The first arm of the pincers were the Australian 7th Division, veterans of North Africa who had just driven the Japanese from the Owen Stanley Mountains and won the great victory of Oivi Gorari, who would advance from Kokoda. The Australians were now firmly established in the Kokoda Valley with a good logistical base at the airstrip, and from here the 7th Division would advance down the Kamusi River Valley and approach the base from the south. As the Australians approached, they would be reinforced by a simultaneous seaborne landing to the east of Buna by the American 32nd Red Arrow Division. After the Japanese defeat at Milne Bay, Australian commandos had begun moving up the north coast of Papua by sea, and by October they had taken the small airfield at Waniglie about 100 kilometers down the coast from the Bunagona area. With the airstrip operational, the lead elements of the 32nd Division, 128th Regiment, was flown in. The commandos of the 2nd 6th Independent Company began advancing overland and by early November were clearing an airstrip at the town of Hongani, just two days' march down the coast. With this area now secure and its airstrip operational, it would serve as the primary logistical base for the 32nd Division. And by mid-November, two of its three regiments, the 126th and 128th, were established and ready to advance on Buna. The Japanese defensive position stretched for about 15 kilometers around the coast, with its primary concentrations in three major villages where airbase and other facilities had been constructed. On the Japanese right was the town of Gona, in the center, San Ananza, and on the far left, Buna. The major concentrations of infrastructure and forces were in the San Ananza and Buna areas, with Gona acting as the anchor to the Japanese right flank, in addition to protecting the naval landing areas. The plan involved a three-pronged advance, with the two Australian brigades attacking towards Gona on the left and down the San Ananda track in the center, and the two regiments of the 32nd Division focusing on Buna. At the highest level, MacArthur's plan had many strengths. By establishing a secondary logistical base at Pongani, the Allies were able to effectively double the forces they could support in the Buna Gona area, achieving this superiority precisely at the time the attack was set to begin. By attacking down multiple different axes, the Japanese would be unable to concentrate reserves against any one attack. Additionally, the Allies would be able to effectively probe for weaknesses across the entire front. Nevertheless, the devil is, as they say, always in the details. Japanese intelligence had let them down badly. Over the prior two months, the Allied advance up the north coast of Papua from Milne Bay was completely undetected. On the 16th of November, the garrison at Buna was shocked to see a force of Allied transports conducting landing operations about 15 kilometers to the east of the Japanese positions. Observers estimated that about a thousand men had been landed in the area. This was the movement of the whole 128th Regiment from Waniglie and Gobe, which had landed at Pongami. The Gona Buna area was only weakly held, 
As the base area for the South Seas Detachment, there were over 13,000 fighting men at Gona and Buna in July and August. However, the bulk of these forces, the 144th and 41st Regiments, had departed the base to begin the advance towards Kokoda and Port Moresby. Cognizant of the threats of the base, in October, the commander of the 17th Army, Lieutenant General Harukichi Hayakutake, had ordered the 41st Regiment to be withdrawn from the mountains, with two of its battalions moved to the Gona Buna sector to bolster the garrison. Nonetheless, as the 144th Regiment had been defeated in the Battle of 2nd Templeton's Crossing, Eora Creek, the 41st Regiment had been drawn into battle around Kokoda itself. During the Battle of Oivi Gorari, just a few days before the American landings, both regiments had been badly mauled and mere remnants were trickling back to the defensive perimeter. Until the survivors of Oivi could be reorganized, the whole Bunagona sector was only held by about 2,500 combat personnel a mix of both army and navy units, and 1,200 labourers. The Battle of Oivi was a crippling blow. With the near destruction of the South Seas Detachment, the whole Japanese position in Papua was now in grave danger of collapse. The gravity of the strategic situation was beginning to dawn upon Tokyo. The optimism of July and September, when all were confident that the Americans would be driven from Guadalcanal as easily as the Australians from Port Moresby, was now long gone. Although the objective of taking Port Moresby was not officially dropped, it was clear that the Japanese forces in the southern front had to be reorganized and repositioned for defense. The reality was, any hope of taking Port Moresby had died with Major General Hori. The idea of wrestling Kokoda from the firm grip of the 7th Division, even with substantial Japanese reinforcements, was a pipe dream. On the 16th of November, five days after the defeat at Oivi and the same day as the American landings at Pongami, the Japanese forces in Papua, New Guinea, and the Solomons were totally restructured. It was clear that 17th Army Command was not capable of directing operations across two fronts, and with the growing Allied strength in the area, substantial reinforcement was warranted. To aid in command and control, the Solomon Islands and New Guinea would now be placed under separate Army Commands. The 18th Army was to be activated and this new force would be responsible for all operations in New Guinea and Papua. To command this new Army, Imperial General Headquarters appointed Lieutenant General Hatato Adachi. A veteran of the Sino-Japanese War, Adachi was a highly experienced and capable commander, leading the 26th Brigade and 37th Division from 1937. He had earned a reputation as a fighting general, often leading from the front, and had served as the Chief of Staff for the North China Area Army. He was a very solid choice to lead operations in Papua and New Guinea. Three additional divisions would be placed under 18th Army Command. Lieutenant General Hayakutake's 17th Army would now solely focus on defending Guadalcanal and the Solomons. The 17th and 18th Armies were placed under the newly formed 8th Area Army Command, which would be headquartered at Rabaul under the command of Lieutenant General Hitoshi Imamura. These arrangements would become effective on the 26th of November 1942. In one of his last actions as the commander of operations in Papua, General Hayakutake ordered immediate reinforcements to be dispatched to the Buna and Gona sector. There was simply no time to await the arrival of General Adachi. The remnants of the 144th Infantry Regiment, maybe a thousand men, were moving back to Buna along the main track from Kokoda, having crossed the Kamusi River before the bridge fell to the Australians. The 41st Regiment had been cut off by the Australian flanking manoeuvre at Gorari and had taken to the jungle. Its remnants appeared to be moving down the opposite bank of the river as the bridges were now in Allied hands. Its strength was unknown. It was clear that fresh units had to be deployed if the Japanese base was to be held. On the night of the 16th of November, under the command of Colonel Yamamoto, the new 144th Regiment Commanding Officer, a force of some 1,500 men departed Rabaul and arrived at Buna some 24 hours later. The force included the battle-hardened 3rd Battalion of the 229th Infantry Regiment, a company of mountain guns, and around 700 reinforcements for the 144th. Yamamoto found the Buna and Gona area under the command of Colonel Yokoyama, as Major General Hori, the South Seas Detachment Commander, was missing. More reinforcements were on the way. In seven days, the 21st Independent Mixed Brigade would deploy from Rabaul, followed quickly by the main strength of the 61st Brigade, which was moving from the Philippines, but the line had to be held until then. The main Japanese defences were concentrated around Buna, where the airbase is located, and San Ananda. The battlefield at Buna and Gona lies in an area of wetland and intertidal swamp. The higher areas, which are only a few metres above sea level, are near the coast where the villages and main Japanese base areas were located. Inland, for several kilometres, this relatively high ground is surrounded by putrid swamp 
a tangled mess of rotting plants and sago palms. As the tide rises and falls each day, large areas would be inundated by waist to chest deep water. The major Japanese base areas were connected by causeways and tracks that followed the higher ground along the coast, which made the movement of reserves difficult. However, the only avenues of approach were on a small number of tracks which were flanked by thickly wooded wetland. Thus, although this terrain made communication between the main Japanese forces difficult, it meant the Allies would be funneled by the swamp to the dry higher ground, itself devoid of any cover. Even on the higher terrain, the ground is so wet that slit trenches only flooded. To counter this, the Japanese engineers had built hundreds of bunkers which sat above ground. Using oil drums filled with earth and felled palm trees, the Japanese were able to construct formidable defensive positions, which were effectively impervious to small arms and artillery. Although above ground, as these fighting positions were primarily constructed with palm logs, they were actually quite well camouflaged. In the Buna and Sanananda areas, these palm tree bunkers had been constructed in depth, with every fighting position covered by another bunker. This network of interlocking machine gun positions was, in places, several thousand meters deep. Thus, although in many places they were unable to use a trench network, the Japanese had built a vast web of heavily fortified and interconnected machine gun positions. These were most heavily concentrated and most formidable along the only dry avenues of approach such as the main tracks. As the ground was dead flat, there was quite literally no cover to be had and any flanking movement had to be made through the putrid swamp where cover was even less prolific. Although outnumbered, the Japanese had constructed quite a killing field, and the swamp would be one of their greatest allies in the battle to come. The terrain was, perhaps, the defining feature of the Battle of Buna and Gona, as it was this quagmire which both dictated the tactical situation and gave this battle its own brown shade of hell. Forced to attack along the few narrow strips of high ground, each separated by miles of morass, the battle effectively became three separate actions, with Japanese and allied units unable to easily aid one another. The Australians would attack the centre and left flank, with the 25th Brigade moving on Gona and the 16th attacking San Ananda. The objective of the two American regiments, the 128th and 126th, was Buna on the allied right flank. Each of these units would fight its own desperate battle in this hellish place, against an enemy that was about to show just how determined it could be in defence. The young men of the 32nd Division, about to face their first battle, had no idea what they were walking into. The 32nd Red Arrow Division was a National Guard formation, equivalent to the Australian militia. Prior to mobilisation, National Guard units were part-time soldiers, and the core of the division had been with the formation well before the war. Raised primarily from the Midwest states of Wisconsin and Michigan, the division participated in a number of major exercises in 1940, culminating in the Great Louisiana Maneuvers of 1941. Upon mobilisation, the division was moved to the US West Coast and rapidly deployed to Australia. Along with the 41st Division, the 32nd formed half of Major General Robert Eichelberger's 1st Corps, which represented the primary US forces under MacArthur's command. The division was commanded by Major General Edwin Harding. Harding was a professional soldier. He graduated West Point in 1909 and held regimental and deputy commands before moving to the 32nd Division. Nevertheless, like many American officers, he lacked combat experience and pre-war maneuvers had not really prepared him, or the division as a whole, for real-world operations. Once in Australia, the 32nd continued training in Victoria, which did improve its ability to maneuver, but the temperate open plains of southern Australia were hardly an appropriate preparation for jungle warfare. In July, the formation was redeployed to Queensland, where it was, ostensibly, to complete substantial jungle warfare exercises. Although various regiments and battalions did complete some jungle training, these episodes proved to be entirely inadequate preparation. After the battle, when MacArthur was inspecting the unit, a young sergeant asked the general that, considering in his whole time in Australia, the platoon had been given exactly two night training problems, how was he expected to match the Japanese in night fighting? Despite the lack of preparation, MacArthur selected this unit for deployment to the Buna Front. He had previously told General Blamey, the South West Pacific Land Force Commander and highest ranking Australian General, that he wanted his American units to get some combat experience. Additionally, one cannot ignore the possibility that MacArthur, the former press officer, also had an eye on how his command was being perceived in the United States. Thus, even though there were more experienced Australian units available, 
the young guardsmen were headed for their baptism of fire. The Americans were confident of an easy victory. Harding wrote to General Sutherland that he believed the Boone garrison to be little more than a shell, scratch detachments which had been left behind as the main combat units had been drawn into battle with the Australians. He estimated that the Americans outnumbered the Japanese by about 3 to 1, and that the battle would be over quickly. On the 3rd of November, MacArthur had ordered the division not to continue advancing until 10 days of supplies had been amassed, which caused great consternation amongst the Americans. An observer noted, Opinions were freely expressed by all officers and ranks. The only reason for the order was a political one. GHQ was afraid to turn the Americans loose and let them capture Buna because it would be a blow to the prestige of the Australians, who had fought the long and hard battle all through the Owen Stanley Mountains, and who therefore should be the ones to capture Buna. It was the boldness of the uninitiated. By November the 16th, Harding was ready to begin his assault on Buna. He had six battalions in two regiments under his command the 128th and 126th, in addition to the 2nd 6th Independent Company of Australian Commandos, which were roughly half a battalion in strength. However, he was badly lacking in terms of fire support. Artillery had been difficult to move prior to the battle, and only a single battery of 3.7-inch mountain guns were allocated to the 32nd. These were well suited to this kind of fighting, but the guns were old and very worn. The artillery commander, O'Hare, struggled to bring the weapons forward as the wooden wheels quickly bogged in the wet ground. Thus, the whole division only had some four guns available to support the attack, the two mountain guns and a pair of Australian 25-pounders, although additional Australian batteries were en route. Worse was his complete lack of armour support, as there was not a single tank available to either American or Australian forces. The one thing that was available in abundance was air support, but this was of little practical use. The Japanese bunkers were almost impossible to see from the ground, let alone through the tree canopy. The advance began inauspiciously. As New Guinea Force HQ had prioritised the advance in the centre, Harding was ordered to place the 126th Regiment under the command of Major General Vassy, the 7th Division Commanding Officer. With nearly half of his force now operating with the Australians and advancing on San Ananda, he had to move his reserve battalion up to take their place. The Japanese positions in this sector ran in a line from the mouth of the Jirua River through the two airstrips and terminating south of Cape Ndeade and were about 5 kilometers in length. It's important not to view the Japanese defenses as a front line, but rather as a complex of bunkers and fighting positions that extended into the rear areas of the base. Near the Buna government station itself was an area called the Triangle, a zone of considerable fortification. There were only three dry avenues of approach to the village. The first was the thin coastal strip that was bordered on the right by the ocean and the left by the swamp, which ran through the small village of Boreo towards the Duropa plantation. This track approached the edge of one of the two airstrips which formed the main area of Japanese defence. A second track followed a seam of high ground, completely surrounded by marsh, about two kilometres inland. This path ran right between the two airstrips, called the Old and New Airfields, which intersected it at 90 degrees. Finally, there was a third avenue, again following a thin causeway through the swamp, which approached the triangle from the left flank, about seven kilometers from the far right. With the loss of one of his regiments, Harding decided to advance with all three of his battalions. The first and third battalions, along with the Australian commandos, would attack the Japanese left along the coast, whilst the second battalion would attack Buna on their right flank. By the 19th of November, these formations were at their attack start lines, but during the night of the 17th, the Japanese position at Buna had been strengthened substantially. Transported by five fast destroyers, which had been diverted from Guadalcanal operations, the entire 3rd Battalion of the 229th Regiment, supported by a mountain gun company and engineers, arrived just before Harding attacked. Under the command of the very energetic and capable Colonel Yamamoto, the fresh battalion immediately advanced to occupy the defences. On the next evening, a further 500 men arrived from Rabaul. Harding was now facing a much stronger enemy, which had been reinforced with a fresh battalion and a new commander, and had lost a third of his forces. Nonetheless, on the 19th the attack went in. On the right flank, along the coastal road, the 1st Battalion advanced. As they reached the edge of the Duropa plantation, they stumbled into the defences manned by Colonel Yamamoto's fresh 3rd Battalion. The Japanese bunkers were very well camouflaged in the palm plantation, and as the guardsmen advanced, they were engulfed in a withering crossfire. Covered by thick grass and bush, the Americans could not identify where the fire was coming from, and as the Japanese rapidly changed positions, the forward companies fell into confusion. 
They attempted to engage the Japanese, but simply could not locate them, and the attack immediately stalled. The United States official history reads, Out of rations, and with the greater part of its ammunition used up, the 1st Battalion ended the day a badly shaken outfit. The troops had entered the battle joking and laughing, and sure of an easy victory. Now they were dazed and taken aback by the mauling they had received at the hands of the Japanese. A few kilometres inland along the Sememi track, the 128th Regiment's 3rd Battalion advanced along a narrow causeway which wound through the swamp. As they marched, they came upon a wide area of high, dry grounds that had been completely cleared of vegetation. The track had reached the area between the two airstrips. As they moved into this perfectly flat and clear ground, the Japanese opened up on them with a withering weight of fire. They had walked into a pre-sighted killing field. Again, the Japanese had emplaced their entrenchments with great skill, and in the battalion commander's own words, the Americans were stopped cold. The next morning found both units in precisely the same positions at the very edge of the Japanese defences. On the afternoon of the 20th, reinforcements reached the frontline units, including 120 Australian commandos of the 2nd 6th Independent Company. The two American battalions were positioned at either ends of the new strip, separated by over a kilometre of wet ground. Harding had planned a multi-battalion attack for the 21st. The 1st Battalion would advance over a narrow 300-yard front anchored on one side by the sea. On their left, the Australian commandos would move towards the edge of the airstrip. To the left of this attack, at the other end of the strip, the 3rd Battalion would advance over the open ground to their front. Harding had organised an air raid for 8.30am, but the lead battalions were not informed and friendly bombs hit the forward elements, killing four and wounding two. A second air raid, which was scheduled for midday and behind which the men were to advance, did not materialise. The bombers finally appeared at 357 and, again, hit the forward companies, this time with 18 casualties, 6 killed. This had a very negative impact on morale. In a near mutiny, some of the men left their start lines and began walking towards the rear. Only after pleading and cajoling from their officers did the men return to their companies. Near dusk, the attack finally went in. The 1st Battalion had barely left their start line when they went to ground in the face of a withering crossfire, and the officers could simply not get the men to advance. To their left, the Australian commandos fared a little better. Carefully advancing towards the airstrip, they cleared four machine gun positions with grenades before their attack, too, stalled. They had advanced about 400 metres, but they were facing heavy machine gun fire and had lost contact with the Americans to their right. With their flank hanging and casualties mounting, they halted just 50 metres from the edge of the airstrip. The commandos, graduates of the Australian Army Special Warfare School in the frigid wilderness of Wilson's Promontory, were, undoubtedly, better prepared for this battle than their allies of the 32nd Division. But they too were unable to make significant headway, such was the nature of the defences which confronted them. On the far left flank, about 5 kilometres to the west, Colonel Smith's 2nd Battalion was approaching Boona down the Jerua track. The track, just like in the other areas, was a narrow causeway surrounded by putrid swamp. Before him, the track split into two paths that suddenly widened, with a relatively small area of dry ground between them. This area, called the Triangle because of the shape it made, was a particularly strong area of fortification. Protected on both flanks by the swamp, the flat ground of the Triangle was covered by interlocking fields of fire, as the Japanese bunkers were arranged in depth. This area was held by the Japanese Marines of the 5th Sasebo Detachment. As Smith approached the Triangle, his lead company was met with a withering fire and barely escaped a devastating ambush. Smith, an aggressive and energetic commander, immediately attempted to flank the defences. With his lead company engaging the Japanese, he sent two companies to move to the wings, one to each flank, and the men immediately plunged into the disgusting morass. As the guardsmen tried to move through chest-deep mud and water, it quickly became apparent that the flanking movement was not a realistic option. Thus, just like the other two battalions, the attack faltered in the face of the Japanese defences. As the day of the 21st came to a close, it was clear that the attack had achieved nothing. There was no chance that the 2nd Battalion could take the triangle without reinforcement. Harding asked General Vassy to return one of the battalions of the 126th Regiment to reinforce the left flank advance to which the Australian agreed. The 2nd Battalion of the 126th Regiment would be dispatched on the 22nd. Given the two days of fighting, it was clear to Harding that the attack crossing the open ground between the two airstrips was little more than suicidal and very unlikely to bear fruit. Thus, 
he decided to concentrate the 1st and 3rd battalions on the far right along the coastal strip, where the Australians were able to make a little ground. The three axes of attack had now become two, each with a strength of two battalions. Those on the left, attacking the triangle, took the name Urbana Force. The right battalions, attacking the airstrip, Warren Force. It was obvious that the 32nd Division had nowhere near enough fire support. In terms of artillery, the situation was beginning to improve with the arrival of several 25-pounder batteries, but what they really needed was tanks. In the flat ground, there was no cover, but the tank itself was a moving pillbox. With armour, they had some chance of making headway. There was a squadron of Stuart Light tanks at Milne Bay, which had been ordered to move up and support Harding, but as with all things in the Papuan campaign, the problem was logistics. There was no shipping available to bring them forward. Despite the lack of fire support, Harding ordered another attack on the right flank. On the 23rd, he attempted to infiltrate the Japanese positions under the cover of a sustained artillery barrage, including all of the regiment's mortars, which were concentrated into one battery. Nevertheless, without observation, the artillery was completely ineffective. The Japanese bunkers were effectively immune to even a 25 pounds of high explosive impact, such was the strength of their construction. In two days, the 1st Battalion advanced about 100 metres. To their immediate left, again the commandos performed better, reaching the airfield and taking several bunkers, but with their right flank exposed they could not advance further. To their far left, Urbana Force was fighting the swamp as much as the Japanese. The two flanking companies had endured a truly dreadful night. Golf Company had been overcome by nightfall whilst it was moving through waist to chest deep water. The men spent the night where they could. Some clambered up trees to find somewhere dry, but many simply stood in the putrid, waist-deep brown water all night, surrounded by swarms of mosquitoes. One can only imagine the state of their feet after a night like that. As the sun rose, the cold and exhausted men continued to advance through the swamp until, in the afternoon, they came upon an elevated piece of ground covered by kunai grass. From here the men could see the eastern edge of the triangle. They were in a good flanking position if they could be supplied. The battalion commander, Colonel Smith, was deeply concerned about their situation and planned to order them to return to battalion HQ. He signalled Harding that their supply line ran through neck deep water, but this message was received as knee deep. Harding overruled Smith's concerns and ordered an attack on the 24th. Air support would be provided and two American mountain guns were now available. There would be a heavy airstrike on the triangle in the morning and Smith's men would follow the bombs in. At 8am on the 24th, the air attack materialised, but there were no bombers, only 12 P-40s, which bombed and strafed the triangle. It suffice to say that this made absolutely no impact on the Japanese fortifications. Smith asked for additional air support, and several hours later a force of four fighters arrived. These not only missed the Japanese, but strafed his own headquarters, evidence of just how difficult the task of close air support is. After this debacle, Smith decided he was going to go in without air support, as thus far it was doing more harm than good, and at 2.30pm the men left their start lines. On the right flank, in the swamp, the exhausted golf company left their dry patch of kunai grass and advanced on the triangle. Easy Company had moved to their start position and would provide suppressive fire to cover the attack. As Golf Company moved through the water towards the Japanese positions, they were pinned on the small embankment which marked the edge of the swamp. The Japanese defences were arranged in depth, one covering the other, so they could not be easily outflanked, and pre-sighted machine gun fire immediately halted the advance. The Japanese soon began to concentrate their automatic weapons and mortars on Easy Company, which faced a torrent of fire. This was the first time this company had faced the enemy, and their weapons, choked by mud and dirt, began to fail them. Even though their casualties were light, one killed and five wounded, the company broke and began retreating to the rear, abandoning their heavy weapons as they went. The attack in the other sectors fared little better. As two companies advanced along the main track, they encountered thick barbed wire covered by several bunkers arranged in a crossfire, preventing any further advance. On the far left, Easy Company of the 126th Regiment was moving through the swamp when it approached a bridge over the entrance creek, but was again halted by heavy machine gun fire. The men could not even see the Japanese positions, let alone engage them, so they dug scratch fox holes which soon filled with putrid brown water, and spent the night in the mud. Harding was mortified at the failure of this attack, but the simple reality was his men were neither prepared nor sufficiently supported to engage fortifications this formidable 
in such nightmarish country. The following week was filled with similar episodes. Although fire support was increasing with additional aircraft and artillery, little progress was made on either flank. On the 26th, a company got lost in the swamp and advanced west instead of north, reporting that it was advancing without meeting enemy resistance, generating great confusion at Harding's HQ. By the 30th of November, nearly two weeks into the battle, the 32nd had not penetrated the triangle on the left or the new strip on the right. The division had lost 492 men to combat and had precious little to show for it. MacArthur was extremely displeased with the battle. Neither the Americans nor the Australians had achieved decisive success, and with reports of the state of the 32nd at Buna, he summoned General Eichelberger, the 1st Corps commander, to MacArthur's forward headquarters at Port Moresby. Eichelberger arrived to find MacArthur grimly pacing up and down the veranda of his HQ, as he later wrote of the encounter. Bob, said General MacArthur in a grim voice, I'm putting you in command at Buna. Relieve Harding. I'm sending you in, Bob, and I want you to remove all officers who won't fight. Relieve regimental and battalion commanders. If necessary, put sergeants in charge of battalions and corporals in charge of companies. Anyone who will fight. Time is of the essence. The Japs may land reinforcements any night. Never want to miss an opportunity for a dramatic flourish, MacArthur concluded. Bob, he said, I want you to take Buna or not come back alive. He paused for a moment and then, without looking at Byers, pointed a finger. And that goes for your chief of staff too. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I said. Eichelberger reached the front at Buna on the 1st of December, where a confused situation greeted him. He first met with Lieutenant General Herring, the commander of the Australian First Corps at Popondetta, the location of his forward headquarters. Herring could not provide Eichelberger with an accurate description of the American positions around Buna as communication with his allies had been poor. He sent his liaison officer, Lieutenant Colonel Robertson, to confer with Harding and report back to First Corps HQ. After finally finding Harding, Robertson asked for a description of the forward positions. Harding replied that he did not know where his forward positions were. He explained that he had lost radio communications with his forward units because the signalers had found the radio equipment to simply be too heavy to carry and so had abandoned it in the bush several miles back. Robertson, an officer of considerable experience and a veteran of Greece and North Africa, was astonished and dismayed at what he found on the Buna front and reported his concerns to Eichelberger and Herring. General Eichelberger decided to inspect the front personally. On the 2nd, he moved up to observe a Warren force attack along the coast. He was told that the front was within sight of the Buna village. When he moved to the forward area, he found that there was no front, just groups of men scattered along rough tracks, with most concentrated towards the rear. The forwardmost troops had not eaten in two days. After a long inspection, the US First Corps intelligence officer reported the following. The troops were deplorable. They wore long, dirty beards. Their clothing was in rags. Their shoes were uncared for or worn out. They were receiving far less than adequate rations, and there was little discipline or military courtesy. Troops were scattered along the trail towards the front line in small groups, engaged in eating, sleeping, during the time they were supposed to be in an attack. At the front, there were portions of two companies, aggregating 150 men. Outside of the 150 men in the foxholes at the front lines, the remainder of the 2,000 men in the combat area could not have even been considered a reserve, since three or four hours would have been required to organize and move them on any tactical mission. Eichelberger was furious. He and Harding were friends. They had graduated in the same class at West Point, but the disorder which had plagued Harding's command was inexcusable. Harding was immediately relieved and replaced by General Waldron, but Eichelberger retained operational command. With the change in officers, the situation at Buna immediately began to improve, as the new commanders began reorganizing the disordered units and doing what they could to improve the supply situation. But even with the infusion of new leadership, progress was painfully slow. On the 5th, another concerted attack was launched on the right flank along the coast, this time supported by Australian Bren gun carriers and artillery. As could be predicted, the light Bren gun carriers were no substitute for tanks, and despite the heavy artillery bombardment, the attack made little headway with the destruction of five Australian vehicles. More progress was made on the American left. Urbana force was slowly beginning to outflank the triangle, but daily gains were measured in tens to hundreds of metres. As he later recollected in his memoirs, Eichelberger led an attack here personally. I watched the advance from the forward regimental command post, which was about 125 yards from Buna village. 
The troops moved forward a few yards, heard the typewriter clatter of Jap machine guns, ducked down and stayed down. My little group and I left the observation post and moved through one company that was bogged down. I spoke to the troops as we walked along. Lads, come along with us. And they did. In the same fashion, we were able to lead several units against the bunkers at Buna village. But even Eichelberger's inspired leadership could not change the physical state of the men he led. Three weeks of hellish combat in a nightmare of mud and water had sapped them of both morale and physical strength. Malnourished from lack of rations, their feet rotting, their clothing little more than rags, many sick with dysentery and malaria, the men of the 32nd Division hardly had anything more to give. Over 1,200 were hospitalized due to sickness. By the 10th of December, Eichelberger received welcome news. Help was on the way. The division's 3rd Regiment had arrived, allowing the frontline units to be moved to the rear, and word began to spread that Australian reinforcements would land soon. Under the command of Brigadier General Wooten, the 18th Australian Brigade, veterans of North Africa, Tobruk and the Battle of Milne Bay were currently moving to reinforce Eichelberger. Critically, they had tanks with them. With their arrival, the first phase of the advance on Buna had ended. Harding has, generally speaking, been blamed for the failure of the 32nd Division to take Buna. But just how fair is this criticism? To be sure, the situation that Eichelberger found in December was bad. The disorder, lack of discipline, and poor supply were inexcusable. Harding had definitely let the battle and the condition of his forces get away from him. Nevertheless, even with the injection of the excellent leadership of Eichelberger himself, the tactical situation did not appreciably change. The simple fact is, the 32nd Division was neither sufficiently trained nor sufficiently supported for the immense challenge that confronted them before Buna. It is hard to think of another example in the entire Second World War where a unit of the United States Army was so unprepared for the task that was demanded of it. Ultimately, it was not Harding that had selected the 32nd Division for the Buna operation, but MacArthur. The experience of the 32nd Division almost perfectly distills MacArthur's strengths and weaknesses as a general. One can almost imagine him leaning over a great map table with his chief of staff, drawing sweeping arrows across the map of Papua. The 32nd would complete a daring envelopment, catching the retreating Japanese base and pinning them between the advancing Australians. Their utter destruction would immediately follow. It was a great idea, a legendary victory in the making. But what about the details? What were the defences like at Buna? How strong could the opposition be? How well trained was the 32nd Division? Was it adequately prepared for jungle operations? What was the state of its combat readiness? How much fire support did it require? Did it need armoured support? How much artillery was available? As was so often the case with MacArthur, these mundane details, upon which so often the outcome of battles is decided, were of little interest. If these areas were inadequate, the men just needed to attack harder, regardless of losses. And, as was so often the case with MacArthur, when his perfect plan began to unravel, the primary problem was the performance of the fighting men or the local commanders. Obviously, it wasn't the plan itself. In reality, as poorly prepared and supported as it was, the 32nd never really stood a chance at Buna. Ultimately, it was the young men of the division who paid for MacArthur's indolence. In early December, General Blamey wrote to the Prime Minister in what can only be described as a tone of shock regarding events at Buna. He was appalled that MacArthur was planning to remove the divisional commander, both regimental commanders, and five out of the sixth battalion commanders, all whilst in contact with the enemy. Such a drastic action was essentially unheard of in Commonwealth armies. Changing leadership has an immediately negative impact on unit cohesion, as it takes time for trust to be built between officers and the men they lead. Thus, such actions truly were drastic. One has to wonder, if all of these officers were so manifestly unfit for command, then why were they in these positions now almost two years after early mobilization? In reality, the answer is these men were not poor officers. They had, just like the rest of the division, simply been poorly prepared, and now MacArthur was trying to amend that lack of preparation by gutting his officer corps in the middle of a battle. As the 32nd Division endured its nightmarish baptism of fire in the quagmire around Buna, Vassie's Australians were also finding their own swampy hell. Major General George Vassie's Australian Brigades were advancing on Buna and Gona from their newly established supply base at Kokoda. 
The Australian advance was spearheaded by the veteran 16th and 25th brigades from the 6th and 7th divisions, although both were operating under the 7th division HQ. These all-volunteer AIF formations had been in battle since 1940 and were amongst the best units in the Australian Army, but they were nowhere even close to being fresh. The 25th Brigade had initiated contact with the Japanese at the Battle of Iori Baiwa on the 14th of September and had been in nearly constant battle for two months. They had advanced from Imata Ridge, across the fearsome Almond Stanley Mountains, on some 200 kilometres of precipitous single-file mountain track. At the gruelling, two-week-long Battle of Second Templeton's Crossing, Yora Creek, where they were relieved by the 16th Brigade, they finally drove the Japanese from their nearly impregnable mountain defences. Fresh from their great victory around Kokoda and with the South Seas Detachment on the run, the Australians, much like the 32nd Division, were confident of an easy victory. But just like their American allies, they were in for a very rude awakening. The two Australian brigades were following the two retreating Japanese regiments, the 144th and 41st, which were moving down either side of the Kamusi River. The 144th Regiment retreated towards the main defensive positions around San Ananda. Over 5,000 men of the proud and elite 144th had left Kokoda in August. Now, barely a thousand starving and badly shaken survivors trickled into the main Japanese defensive line. Although these men badly needed relief, given their nearly three months of constant combat with the Australians, the primary defensive line in the Japanese centre was very weakly held, primarily by engineers. However, if the 144th Regiment could hold the Australians for just a few days, substantial reinforcements in the form of the 21st Independent Mixed Brigade would, hopefully, arrive to relieve them. Although the 144th Regiment were utterly exhausted, as they moved into their new defensive line, they found excellent fighting positions waiting for them. Just as they had around Buna, the Japanese engineers had masterfully constructed heavily fortified fighting positions, a network of heavy bunkers built of palm trees. As the town of San Ananda was the centre of the Japanese positions, the defences here were the deepest. They began about 5 kilometres inland. Much like the area around Buna, there was only one avenue of advance through the swampland for which this area of the battle would be named, the San Ananda Track. Spearheaded by the 2nd 1st Battalion, the brigade advanced rapidly, and by the 20th of November they had reached the first Japanese positions. Australian Imperial Force Units, the Army's all-volunteer formations, are referred to as the second unit to have held that designation. The battalion had been encountering Japanese rearguard units for the better part of a week, capturing starving Japanese stragglers as they moved. As the lead company reached a fork in the track, the grounds opened from a swamp to an area of kunai grass. As the Australians were met with heavy machine gun fire, the battalion CO, Cullen, immediately began planning for a flank attack. For the first time in the pursuit, the Australians were engaged by heavy and accurate artillery fire, which convinced Cullen he had now reached the main defensive line. Indeed, shell fire began to land around his battalion HQ. Cullen ordered two rifle companies to swing left in a wide hook, keeping to the vegetated swamp and avoiding the open ground. The battalion's other two companies continued to probe the Japanese defences along the main track. Here battle raged as the lead company assaulted the defences. To their immediate rear, the 4th Rifle Company executed a close right hook, pressing the Japanese left flank. They were able to penetrate the outpost line, but were halted by a torrent of machine gun fire just 30 metres from the main Japanese positions. As these two companies engaged the Japanese, casualties began to mount. Groups of men were pinned in small areas of cover by the weight of machine gun fire. Cullen estimated his men were engaged by at least 10 automatic weapons. As the battalion brought its mortars into action, they were hit with very accurate counter-battery fire. The Japanese had artillery observers in the trees and were directing accurate fire on his HQ. With the direct assault along the track held in the face of fearsome machine gun fire, the rest of the brigade were moving up to the aid of the 2nd 1st Battalion. In addition to the other two Australian battalions, Americans were moving up to the line. The lead elements of the 126 Regiment's two battalions were approaching the front, by nightfall, the lead companies had been reinforced and elements of all three of the brigade's battalions were now in contact. On the far left, a company led by Captain Cattens had made a wide and stealthy left hook through the swamp. As night fell, the Australians, about 80 strong, crawling through the kunai grass, came upon the main Japanese positions. Cattens could see the glow of small campfires as the Japanese were cooking their evening meals. He could also see one of the artillery pieces that was causing the Australians so much trouble its crew busily firing the weapon. 
Immediately to his rear were two Australian rifle companies. This force had been ordered to cut the track behind the Japanese defences if they could, but the artillery piece was too good a target to ignore. The three company commanders, Cattens, Simpsons and Liani, faced a stark choice. They had no communication with the other Australian forces and had no hope of reinforcement or resupply. Thus, they only had two options, attack and hope to use surprise to their advantage, or withdraw back to friendly lines. Their unanimous decision was to attack. The three companies deployed for the assault, spreading out the line at five paces per man. They moved silently through the darkness, walking carefully through the tall grass with the noise of the artillery masking their advance. As this area was further inland, it was much drier, and here the Japanese defences consisted of a trench network linking its machine gun positions. At just 50 paces distance, the Japanese finally saw their stalking enemy and battle erupted. The Japanese rushed to their machine gun positions, and a pair of weapons cut swaths through the attackers, but the Australians were too close, and within seconds they were amongst them. As machine gun fire lit up the darkness, the attackers were into the trenches. The fighting here was hand to hand, and many Japanese met their fate at the end of a bayonet. Groups began to break and flee to the rear, but several Japanese machine gun crews bravely manned their weapons, but soon died at their guns. The Japanese position had been penetrated, and the artillery captured, but at great cost. Two company commanders, Simpson and Liani, had been killed leading the attack. As morning broke, Catton's men faced a desperate day of survival. Like a thin wedge, they had penetrated the primary Japanese defences, but only 200 strong they were now surrounded by an enraged enemy. The Japanese were determined to rectify the situation, and they now had a very clear understanding of Catton's position. At about 6 o'clock, they launched a very well-executed counter-attack, advancing from three sides simultaneously. The Australians had dug in during the night, but were very low on ammunition after the previous evening's battle. They held their fire until the Japanese were just 15 metres away, hidden as they were in the dark twilight. The attack melted in the face of determined resistance and withering close-range fire. Corporal Ledden, a dock worker from Paddington, was seen to kill eight Japanese men with his Lee Enfield, although he believed he hit several more. On the extreme left flank, a Corporal Fletcher was fighting from a weapon pit when he ambushed an advancing party of Japanese infantry with a grenade burst, then tearing into them with submachine gun fire, breaking their advance. By the end of the day, all of Fletcher's section would be killed or wounded. Although the first attack was broken by the stubborn defence, the Japanese persisted. As the day of vicious battle raged, Australian casualties began to mount. During the night, the wounded had been collected under the shade of a large tree in the centre of the Australian position but daylight revealed just how exposed this location was. Devoid of any cover, the wounded were subjected to enemy fire all throughout the day and several were killed. As Catton's men held on, the main Australian concentrations began advancing. With their position now compromised, the main Japanese elements began to withdraw and by late afternoon, lead patrols had relieved Catton's. As elements of the 2nd, 3rd Battalion moved through the forward Australian units, they came across the next section of Japanese entrenchments a line of pre-sighted machine gun positions with cleared fields of fire. Their advance had been brought to a halt, but they had successfully penetrated the first line of defence. On the 21st of November, MacArthur ordered all Allied units to attack on the Buna and San Ananda fronts, regardless of losses. This was a ridiculous order, more an episode of theatre than war. Just as the American strength had been expended in the fierce fighting around Buna, the Australians on the San Ananda track could give no more. The 16th Brigade had lost almost a third of its strength to battle alone, 25 officers and 536 men, and was simply incapable of continuing the attack. The unit was ravaged by malaria and scrub typhus, and the total strength of the brigade was now barely a thousand men. As the exhausted Australians dug in before the main defensive line, the attack now passed to Colonel Tomlinson's 126th Regimental Combat Team. The Americans were keen to engage the enemy and Vassy ordered the 16th Brigade to support the 126th. Tomlinson's plan was to pinch out the forward Japanese positions by a double envelopment. He deployed a pair of companies to either side of the Australian positions, intending to attack on both flanks simultaneously. However, this plan took time to materialise. On the Allied right, the Americans made little headway in the face of determined resistance. During the days of the 22nd to the 25th, the 1st Battalion attacked twice with heavy mortar support, but made little ground. During these actions, there were numerous acts of individual bravery, including Captain Lee, a South Carolina native who was awarded the Silver Star on the 22nd, himself wounded on the 25th. On the left, a rifle company was planning a repeat of Catton's attack by executing a wide left hook through the swamp. 
Navigation was difficult in the mangroves, and on the 23rd the group became lost. By the 24th, the Americans had found themselves in a good flanking position, about a thousand meters behind the primary Japanese defenses. Joined on their right flank by elements of the Australian 2nd 1st Battalion, the Americans spent several awful nights with their allies in the mud, whilst the main attack was launched along the track. American infantry battalions had more firepower than their Australian equivalents, especially mortars, and these were used to great effect. But it took time to bring up these heavy weapons, which were also supplemented by a battery of Australian 25-pounders. By the morning of the 26th, the attack was ready. Two companies of the 1st Battalion were at their start line, just to the left of the track. The attack was preceded by a devastating artillery barrage. All of the available Australian and American mortars, in addition to a battery of the 2nd 1st Field Regiment. But on both the left and right flanks, only about 300 metres were gained with heavy losses. Just as the Australians had found, the defences along the track itself were nearly impregnable, so Tomlinson decided to shift the weight of the attack to the left flank. By the 30th, the far left position out in the swamp had been reinforced, and the main body of the 1st Battalion had moved through the Australian left. At the head of five infantry companies, including the regiment's anti-tank gun units which were fighting as infantry, Captain Bond led the attack. Marked by a sharp battle, the initial assault went well and was pressed with vigour. They had found a weak spot in the Japanese defences and were quick to exploit it. By 5pm, they had cut the track behind the main defensive line and had 600 men digging in. They had established a position called the Huggins Roadblock and had compromised the Japanese defences, but the brave Captain Bond was wounded leading the attack. The guardsmen had fought well. It had taken them about a week, but they too had penetrated the enemy line. They had established a strong defensive position across the main track that would prove very difficult for the Japanese to dislodge. Nevertheless, unlike the flanking attack of Catton's a week before, this penetration did not compel the Japanese to withdraw as it had not compromised the main defensive position. Rather, the guardsmen had exploited a gap in the fixed defences and cut the track. The defenders simply stayed in their bunkers. Thus, although the Americans had outflanked the Japanese, they were, themselves, isolated. Although the American position stood solid like a rock, defeating several determined Japanese counterattacks by the 1st Battalion of the 41st Regiment, if it could not be relieved, then the ground gain would be for naught. For the next two weeks, the attention of both sides was focused on maintaining and relieving their forward positions. Supplying the American roadblock required a long march through the swamp, and wounded had to be carried out. Along the track itself, the Japanese positions were still nigh impregnable. By the 5th of December, the Americans had still not broken through, and resupply patrols were being routinely ambushed by the Japanese. The 126th Regiment had achieved much by establishing the roadblock, but they were not capable of clearing the defences or advancing from their most forward positions, and their strength was being drained by both the Japanese and the swamp. General Herring, the New Guinea Force Commander, decided that additional forces needed to be deployed if the 7th Division was going to break through to the Americans. He deployed the 30th Brigade, an Australian militia unit which was just as inexperienced as the 32nd Division. This unit had formed the core of the Port Moresby garrison and had been only rated for static defensive roles by Australian command, but there were simply no more experienced units left. The two Australian battalions, the 49th and the composite 55th 53rd, were green. There was a core element of the 53rd Battalion which had seen action along the Kokoda track, although it had performed so badly there it had to be relieved during the worst heat of the withdrawal. Its best men had been sent to the 39th Battalion as reinforcements, with the remainder amalgamated with the 55th. The vast majority of these men were about to experience their first battle. The newly arrived Brigadier Porter was planning a brigade attack down the main track on the 7th. His objective was to break through to the Americans at the roadblock, which he intended to do with alternating battalion attacks on either side of the track. By the morning of the 7th of December, the day of reckoning had come for the 49th. Arranged on the left side of the track, the four companies attacked on a two-company front, with the two rearmost moving in close reserve. By this time in the battle, the Allies were relying heavily on artillery, and the attack went in behind an hour-long bombardment. As the men were waiting for the torrent of mortar and artillery explosions to cease, the Japanese opened up on them with heavy machine gun fire through the maelstrom, an indication of just how strong their defences were. Already suffering casualties before they had left their start line, the attack began. The militiamen advanced into the teeth of murderous machine gun fire. On the left flank, near the swamp, Captain Foster's company made good ground, about 800 metres, 
clearing a number of machine gun positions and linking up with the 2nd 2nd Battalion, which was guarding the Americans' flank. Nonetheless, in just a few hours fighting, they had taken horrendous casualties, including the right flank company CO and several platoon commanders. Although the lead companies here had made good ground, they had lost contact with the two reserve companies. The attack plan involved the two fresh companies immediately attacking once the impetus of the first assault had waned, but in the thick bush, they were further behind than intended. This caused a delay in the second attack, which allowed the Japanese to recover. On the right, the reserve company was stopped cold and could not make any further gains. On the left, Captain Noy's company advanced a further 500 metres into the teeth of a murderous crossfire. By the time he stopped, of the 98 men he entered the battle with, only 35 were still fighting. The 49th had made good ground, the greatest inroads into the Japanese defences since the establishment of the roadblock on the 30th, but they had been cut to pieces. At 2pm, Brigadier Porter decided to keep the 49th in its current positions and make an afternoon attack with the 53rd 55th. They were to immediately attack along the right side of the track. Their inexperience immediately showed. As they moved through the thick bush, they came under heavy machine gun fire from well-concealed positions. Rather than spreading out, the men clumped together, making them easy targets. As they continued to move forward, they came under heavy flanking fire from the right side of the track and after advancing about 100 metres, the militiamen went to ground. They had paid dearly for their slim gains. In two hours of fighting, the battalion had lost eight officers and 122 men, killed, wounded or missing. Just like its experience along the Kokoda track, it was painfully obvious that this battalion was simply not ready for combat operations as difficult as this. The 7th of December was a dark day for the Australian Army. Although they had made good ground to the left of the track, their casualties had been murderous. As a point of comparison, in just one day's fighting, the militiamen had suffered comparable casualties to the 126 regiment's two weeks of combat operations, which was all the more severe considering it was a significantly smaller formation. Thus, by mid-December, a stalemate had developed along the San Ananda track. As the days passed, the strength of the 126 regiment was being drained by combat and sickness. The 16th Brigade was utterly exhausted by three months of continual combat, and now the 30th Brigade had been cut to shreds. The Allies had committed the best part of an infantry division down the San Ananda track, some seven battalions, but had been unable to achieve decisive success. Protected on their flanks by the swamp in bunkers that were impervious to artillery, the Japanese defences were nearly impregnable. As the 16th Brigade had demonstrated on the 20th of November, the elite, battle-hardened AIF units, some of the best assault infantry in the British Commonwealth, could make substantial and rapid inroads, but there were no more of these units available. The Australian militia and US National Guard formations had fought bravely and made some gains, but were unable to break defences as formidable as these. Indeed, by December 25th, Vassie was considering withdrawing the Americans from the roadblock, as not only was keeping them supplied becoming a serious challenge, but given their condition, they were not capable of attacking. The Japanese had, thus far, won a substantial defensive victory, and it was clear that the battle could only be won in other sectors. As vicious combat raged at Buna and along the San Ananda track, the Australian 25th Brigade was closing in on Gona, at the extreme right of the Japanese line. They had been pursuing the retreating Japanese 41st Regiment from Kokoda, picking up stragglers and abandoned supplies as they went. The small village of Gona not only anchored the Japanese flank, but it also protected the primary landing area. Thus, holding the village was critical if the Japanese were going to be able to land the substantial reinforcements they had available. Brigadier Ether's three battalions were in high spirits, but they were not in good physical shape. All now at roughly half strength, they had marched all the way to Gona from Port Moresby, and as they entered the sweltering lowlands, malaria became endemic. Nonetheless, they pursued the retreating Japanese closely. By the 18th of November, resistance began to stiffen. They were closing in on Gona itself, and Japanese elements were holding cleared areas of kunai grass, slowing the attack. Ether's rapid advance had outstripped his logistics, and ammunition was running low. The Australians had cut out a dropping zone, but were unable to bring forward any heavy weapons. By the 22nd of November, with supplies now being dropped to his brigade, Ether decided to attack Gona itself. All three battalions would advance, with only one company left to hold the dropping zone. By 10.30, the lead battalion was engaging Japanese elements about a thousand metres south of Gona, and the 2nd 31st and 2nd 25th battalions began fanning out to either flank, 
The 2nd 31st had crossed the Gona Creek and were now approaching the village from the west along the coast. Their right flank was anchored on swampland, their left the ocean. The whole battalion was able to reach a start line just 300 metres away from the main Japanese defences and at midnight the attack began. The diary of the 2nd 31st Battalion recorded the action. At zero, the men rose and were immediately met by a most intense fire from the front and right flank. They cheered and yelled as they advanced and returned a heavy barrage of automatic fire. They reached the Jap pits but were not strong enough to continue as they were then enfiladed from both sides. Lieutenant Phelps was killed, Captain Beasley, missing, believed killed, and Lieutenant Hayes was wounded. The attack died down but the enemy continued a most intense rate of fire. The nighttime engagement cost the battalion 65 casualties. Stung by this reverse, Ether decided that the Japanese were in much greater strength at Gona than he had anticipated, and his worn and depleted command was unlikely to be able to take the position unsupported. The Japanese garrison at Buna was not large, perhaps equivalent to an overstrength battalion, but the fortifications here were as well sited and constructed as the other sectors. The credit for the quality of the defences throughout the battle has to be laid at the feet of Major Yamamoto Tsunichi, the 17th Army Fortifications Officer, who commanded the Gona garrison. Additionally, the tenacious defence was simply a hallmark of the Japanese fighting spirit, a quality they would show all throughout the battle. In the four days of combat since the 19th of November, Ether's 25th Brigade had lost 17 officers and 187 men in battle. Including sick, all of the battalions were well under half strength. With the failure of the left flank attack, Ether withdrew the 2nd 31st Battalion across the river to his main positions. By the 26th of November, little impression had been made against the defences. However, relief was on the way. On this day, Brigadier General Doherty arrived at Ether's HQ. Doherty had taken over the command of the 21st Brigade from Brigadier General Potts, the veterans of the Kokoda Track Campaign. Composed of the 2nd 14th, 2nd 16th and 39th Battalions, the heroes of the Battle of Isarava, the 21st had spent three months recuperating at Port Moresby. There is definitely a poetic symmetry in the relief of the 25th Brigade by the 21st, as it was these same battalions that saved Potts' exhausted command at the Battle of Iori Baiwa. Given a choice by 7th Division Command as to where to deploy his brigade, Doherty decided that he had a better chance of achieving decisive success by concentrating on the Japanese right flank. The two brigadiers hammered out a battle plan. The defences at Gona were very compact perhaps 300 metres in width. It was more like a fortress rather than the wide defensive positions at San Ananda and Buna. Ether's 25th Brigade would maintain positions in close contact with the defences, while Doherty's 21st would move to the right flank and drive to the sea, cutting the coastal track that ran from Gona to the main Japanese concentrations to the east. Once Gona had effectively been isolated, the 21st Brigade would attack along the coastal track. This plan was put into action on the 29th of November. With Ether's exhausted brigade capable of little more than holding their position, the fresh 21st began advancing to the sea. Although the Japanese were concentrated in the defences around Gona itself, they had deployed elements and fighting patrols along the coastal road. If the Australians were able to surround Gona, it would only be a matter of time before the garrison fell, so the Japanese did what they could to oppose this manoeuvre. As the 2nd 33rd, 3rd and 2nd 25th battalions tried to invest Gona by moving in close to the fortifications, they were all engaged in nearly constant battle with the Japanese garrison. Unwilling to simply sit inside their defensive perimeter, the Japanese launched numerous fighting patrols. As daily combat continued, the Australian forces around Gona were simply being consumed by the fire. Casualties were mounting by the day as the exposed Australian forces were engaging well-entrenched Japanese infantry with pre-sighted machine guns, and as the time passed, malaria and typhus took its equally heavy toll. Along the coast, the 2nd 14th had reached the sea, cutting the Buna Gona track. As they approached Gona from the east, they entered a deserted village. As the lead elements moved between the abandoned huts, the Japanese unleashed a torrent of fire from well-concealed fighting positions. It took the 2nd 14th three days of fighting to clear this village, eventually flattened by mortar fire. Although the Australians were now in command of a large stretch of shoreline between Gona and San Ananda, the 2nd 14th Battalion was at an effective strength of just over 150 men. A little further inland, the 2nd 16th had suffered nearly as dearly. But the Australians were closing in. By the 1st of December, they now had substantial fire support in the form of 25 pounders and ample mortar ammunition. 
Although the compact defense made them more able to withstand direct infantry assault, it also made the Japanese vulnerable to artillery and air raids. At 5.30am, the Japanese defenses were drenched with hundreds of artillery and mortar rounds. Behind the bombardment, with bayonets drawn, two battalions, with a strength of one, charged the Japanese position. But they were met with a ferociously dogged Japanese resistance. On the right, near the beach, one company of the 2nd 27th Battalion captured the Japanese outpost line but were halted by heavy enemy fire. To their left, other companies had broken through the defences and penetrated into the village of Gona itself, right in the centre of the Japanese fortress. But the 3rd Battalion had lost contact with them and had not moved up to support their left flank, leaving them totally exposed. As two platoons made it into the village and began to clear it, they were engulfed by a ferocious flanking fire from the intact defensive line. With victory almost within reach, the brave men of the 2nd 27th Battalion, unsupported on their flank, had to withdraw. By nightfall, all of the Australians who had reached the village had become casualties. With Gona still in Japanese hands and casualties mounting fast, concern was growing in 7th Division HQ. Major General Vassi was considering leaving Gona in Japanese hands and simply blockading them. But Brigadier Doherty had one last card to play, one fresh battalion, the 39th. Yes, the legendary 39th Battalion, heroes of the Kokoda track and perhaps the most famous infantry unit in Australian military history. Just as the Battle of Isaraba had depended upon their bravery, so would the battle for Gona. Fresh and at comparatively full strength, the battalion had just been flown in from Port Moresby. Doherty planned an attack for the 8th of December. Along the coastal track, the rest of the brigade, specifically the 2nd 14th and 2nd 16th battalions, what was left of them anyway, would continue pressing the defences from the east. The four companies of the 39th battalion, now stronger than the other elements of the brigade combined, would assault the village from the south. This was the Australians' last chance. The fighting strength of the 21st Brigade was now 37 officers and 755 men, less than the paper strength of a full battalion. If the attack failed, then Gona would have to be abandoned to the Japanese. The whole battle rested on the 39th Battalion. The plan for the attack involved three phases. First, the battalion would attack from the south and clear the southern defences. They would then advance northwest and clear the village, and finally move west to the Gona River. Vassi had allocated 250 rounds of artillery ammunition to the preliminary bombardment. Critically, the 25-pounders were now using delayed fuses, allowing the shell to penetrate about a metre before detonating, which actually made the Japanese bunkers vulnerable. At 11.30am, the maelstrom of artillery fire fell on the small Japanese defensive position. Huge lumps of dirt and mud were lifted high by the deeply bursting shells. At 12.30, the barrage lifted and the militiamen advanced. They attacked across a two-company front, one on either side of the main track. On the right, Captain Gilmore's company had advanced perilously close to the Japanese positions under the cover of the bombardment, and soon as it lifted, the Australians were amongst the defenders. Their right-wing platoon under Lieutenant Kelly suffered losses but charged through the outer defences and came into the village itself. A Corporal Ellis charged ahead of his company, clearing three Japanese fighting positions single-handed. On the left flank, Seward's company had been held firm in the face of pre-sighted machine guns. Seeing that there was little chance of making ground there, Lieutenant Colonel Horner, the battalion CO, ordered the two reserve companies to reinforce the right wing where a clear breakthrough had been made. After some six hours of close-range combat fought inside the Japanese trenches with bayonet, submachine gun and grenade, most of the southern defences had fallen to the 39th. On the Australian right flank, along the coast, the rest of the brigade was pushing through thick bush to link up with the 39th Battalion, but the resistance in this area was as fearsome as ever. By nightfall, they had made some progress, squeezing the remaining Japanese forces into a narrow corridor about 200 metres in width. With the heart of the Japanese position, Gona Mission, now about to fall, the remainder of the garrison desperately tried to escape the Australian pincers. Major Yamamoto, still alive and leading the defence, ordered the withdrawal. Leading about 100 survivors, Yamamoto began pressing through the open corridor, wet swampy ground that led to the southeast. As the Japanese men advanced, they found themselves flanked by the two Australian forces. In a devastating ambush, the whole Japanese force was slaughtered in a cacophony of Bren gun fire. None escaped alive. The morning of the 9th revealed the true horror of the Japanese position at Gona. The 21st Brigade advanced through the village and mission, 
mopping up small pockets of resistance and taking 16 prisoners, including 10 wounded. The whole area reeked of death and putrid, rotting flesh. The Japanese had been too desperate to bury their dead, and instead had used them to supplement the sandbags on the front of their fighting positions. The stench of death was so bad that many of the Japanese were wearing gas masks. An Australian reporter, embedded with the 21st Brigade, recounted the sight. Rotting bodies, sometimes weeks old, formed part of the fortifications. The living fired over the bodies of the dead, slept side by side with them. In one trench was a Japanese who had not been able to stand the strain. His rifle was still pointed at his head, his big toe was on the trigger, and the top of his head was blown off. Everywhere, pervading everything, was the stench of putrescent flesh. Gona had fallen, and in the cratered wasteland that had once been a picturesque Papuan village, the Australians found 638 dead Japanese men. They themselves had suffered 750 killed, wounded, or missing. Just as the Australians were enjoying the macabre fruits of their victory, a new threat was materialising to their west. As the Battle for Gona raged, what the Australians did not know is the Japanese 18th Army Command was desperately trying to reinforce the Gona Buna Front. The majority of the 21st Independent Mixed Brigade was deployed as emergency reinforcements for the Buna area. The first element, which consisted of the 1st Battalion of the 170th Infantry Regiment and the main strength of the 1st Battalion of the 38th Mountain Artillery Regiment, led by Major General Yamagata, left Rabaul on the 28th of November aboard four destroyers, Magikumo, Kazagumo, Igumo, and Shiratsuyu, and headed for the anchorage at Gona. As the convoy moved along the coast of New Britain, it was detected by Allied aircraft. A force of 12 B-17 struck the convoy, scoring a direct hit on Shiratsuyu, inflicting heavy damage, and a near miss on Makigumo. Both returned to Rabaul, and the other destroyers could not find a landing zone. After the utter failure of the first attempt to reinforce the area, a second convoy left Rabaul on the 30th of November. This time the convoy included the Brigade HQ, the 3rd Battalion of the 170th Regiment, and the Brigade Signals Battalion. Under a heavy fighter escort, the five destroyers arrived at the Gona anchorage, but could not commence landing operations because of increased air activity. Instead, they disembarked their forces at the mouth of the Kamusi River, about 20 kilometers along the coast from Gona. The Japanese landing operations were conducted under the surveillance of an Australian coast watcher who vectored numerous Allied aircraft to harass the landing. Under air attack, the nighttime landings were badly confused, and the battalion was strung out along several kilometers of coastline. On the 8th of December, the day that Gona fell, a third convoy left Rabaul containing the remainder of the 21st Independent Mixed Brigade. Despite heavy air escort, the six destroyers were caught in daylight by Allied aircraft. Struck by 23 B-17s, two ships suffered direct hits and the whole convoy returned to Rabaul. Thus, on the 9th of December, the hard-won Australian position at Gona was threatened by a fresh Japanese formation that was approaching from the west. The total force included a new Japanese battalion, the 3rd of the 170th Infantry Regiment, in addition to a machine gun company, engineers, and some supporting units. The total force was about 600 men, including some 41st Regiment stragglers. This unit was equal in fighting strength to the depleted Australian battalions which opposed them. Warned that an enemy force was approaching from the west, Doherty had deployed the 2nd 14th Battalion across the Gona Creek, where it had begun skirmishing with the approaching Japanese force. A patrol found the Japanese holding a small cluster of huts about two kilometers along the coast from Gona, a position called Hattie's Village. The Japanese were advancing along the coastal track near the beach and evidently were not sending flanking patrols inland. Colonel Horner, the commander of the 39th Battalion, began a rapid inland maneuver. As the skeleton of the 2nd 14th Battalion, which was placed under his command, engaged the Japanese in front of the village, Several companies of the 39th were executing a long left hook. As they moved through the dense bush, a company was able to move into an ambush position covering the road behind the main Japanese position at Hattie's village, with two companies to the south of the village itself. On the 16th of December, the trap laid by the Australians was sprung. As the 2nd 14th and elements of the 39th Battalion, a Japanese company came rushing down the track. As they moved in front of the concealed Australian Bren gun positions, a torrent of automatic fire engulfed them. In the first moments, over 30 Japanese men fell dead and the rest fled to the west. The lead Japanese elements around the village, several companies in strength, were now surrounded, 
Without the advantage of well-constructed fortifications, the Japanese were quickly outfought by the Australians, with each defensive position reduced in turn by small units. In one example of these actions, during the night of the 17th, Corporal Ellis, alone, crawled across a hundred metres of no man's land right up to a Japanese medium machine gun position unnoticed. Silently, he lobbed three grenades into the pit, blowing the gun crew to pieces. As the Australian companies edged closer to the main Japanese defences, they were soon in position to launch a concerted attack, and on the morning of the 18th of December the final blow was struck. Two companies of the 39th Battalion surged out of the kunai grass just 100 metres from the village into the teeth of heavy Japanese fire. Lieutenant Dalby, a platoon commander and veteran of the Battle of Isaraba, suicidally charged a Japanese medium machine gun position, spraying it with his Owen gun and killing the crew. His men surged behind him and within minutes the village had fallen. Yet another glorious episode in the history of this legendary battalion. In the area around Hattie's village, the Australians found over 150 dead Japanese, and there were indications that at least that many had been wounded. With the Australian victory, the western threat to Gona had been eviscerated. As Christmas 1942 approached, one section of the Japanese defences had finally been cleared, but the Americans and Australians were still heavily committed in the San Ananda and Buna fronts. In both places, the Allied assaults had broken upon the Japanese defences like a wave on a rocky shoreline, but on the far right of the Allied line, badly needed reinforcements were headed for Buna. Brigadier General Wooten, commander of the veteran 18th Brigade, had flown into Herring's New Guinea Force headquarters at Popondetta. His orders, given to him personally by General Blamey, were to move two of his battalions, the 2nd 9th and 2nd 10th, in addition to two tank troops from the 2nd 6th Armoured Regiment to the front at Buna, and clear the Japanese defences located at the Old Strip, New Strip, and Buna Government Station. These were welcome reinforcements for the beleaguered 32nd Division. The Japanese bunker defences around Buna had proved nearly impregnable, and the Australians were sending Eichelberger some of the finest units in the Australian Army. Along with the 9th Australian Division, the brigade as a whole had defended the port of Tobruk against overwhelming German and Italian forces. In August 1942, the 2nd 10th Battalion had fought in the vicious defence of the KB mission at the Battle of Milne Bay. These were veteran assault infantry, and they were bringing armour, a critical Allied weakness thus far in the battle. Wooten and Eichelberger agreed that upon arrival of the 18th Brigade, Warren Force would be placed under Wooten's command, including all of the American units in the coastal sector. By the 16th of December, the first echelon of Wooten's forces were approaching the front. Eight M5 Stuart Light Tanks of the 2nd 6th Regiment and the 2nd 9th Battalion, which was at nearly full strength, some 34 officers and 648 men. There was also ample artillery support, eight Australian 25-pounders in two batteries of the 2nd 1st and 2nd 5th Regiments and four American 105 mountain guns under Major O'Hare. The American forces under Wooten's command included the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 128th Regimental Combat Team, an element of the 1st Battalion of the 126th Regiment. These American forces were manning the front along the Old Strip and the Inland Route, areas which had seen such heavy fighting and frightful American losses in November. Brigadier General Wooten and Colonel Martin, the former Warren Force commander, consolidated their headquarters. Martin effectively remained in command of the original components of Warren Force, he simply took his direction from Wooten, as it seemed counterproductive to dramatically change the command arrangements. Wooten outlined his plans to the Americans. His objective was to clear the area between the Old Strip and Buna Government Station, but this had to be completed in phases. The first phase would involve the clearing of the Duropa Plantation behind the two airstrips and the ocean. The primary striking force would be the 2nd 9th Battalion, supported by seven tanks. All of Warren Force's mortars and artillery would support the striking force. The primary reserve would be the 2nd 10th Battalion, one of the Stuart tanks, all of the available Bren gun carriers, and the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 128th Regiment. The attack was scheduled for the 18th of December. At 5.30am the men were at their start positions, just behind the forward outpost line. The Americans withdrew to the right, opening up fire lanes for the tanks. The battalion would attack across a narrow front just 500 metres wide, with their right flank on the ocean. Three companies would advance with the tanks, following the line of the coast. On the left, one company was ordered to take up blocking positions at the end of the new strip, protecting the flank of the advancing Australians. Unfortunately, the weather prevented air support. Nonetheless, the artillery bombardment was impressive. 
Supported by the massed mortars of Warren Force, the Japanese positions were drenched in high explosive. At 7am, the Australians moved out. The tanks throttled down to a walking pace, with the infantry slowly advancing alongside and behind them, standing tall, dread guns slung over their shoulders, following the bombardment as it advanced. The attack immediately gained ground, as the bunkers, each like its own small fortress with earth and steel roofs, opened up on the advancing infantry, they were instantaneously engaged by the tanks. Although the Stuart's 37mm main gun could not destroy the Japanese fortifications, combined with its coaxial machine guns, it was very effective at suppressing the bunker. As soon as one of these murderous Japanese fighting positions was identified, the tank would move up, drenching the openings with fire. As the bunker was suppressed, the infantry moved up around the flanks and closed in, finishing the Japanese off with grenades. These tactics proved to be very effective. Methodically, the walking Australians cleared one bunker after another. General Eichelberger, who witnessed the attack, wrote of it later. It was a spectacular and dramatic assault, and a brave one. From the new strip to the sea was about half a mile. American troops wheeled to the west in support, and other Americans were assigned to mopping up duties. But behind the tanks went the fresh and jaunty Aussie veterans, tall, moustached, erect, with their blazing Tommy guns swinging before them. Concealed Japanese positions, which were even more formidable than our patrols had indicated, burst into flame. There was the greasy smell of tracer fire and heavy machine gun fire from barricades and entrenchments. Steadily, tanks and infantrymen advanced through the spare, high coconut trees, seemingly impervious to their heavy opposition. The attack was composed of dozens of these small battles with individual bunkers. On the right of the advance along the coast, Lieutenant McIntosh led his platoon forward with one tank in support. A few hundred metres after leaving their start line, they were approaching a log bunker McIntosh had found the night before by crawling forward of the American positions. As the tank advanced on the bunker, two medium machine guns opened up on the Australians. Immediately the Stuart blasted the bunker's murder hole with machine gun fire and the infantry quickly closed in, lobbing grenades through the openings. Two of the Japanese survivors crawled out of the wreckage, badly wounded. One shot Lance Corporal Tyler in the arm, but the Australian shot him dead at five yards range. McIntosh's company cleared six other bunkers that morning, and within an hour they were turning west, having advanced all the way to the sea. Nonetheless, along the Australian line the battle became tougher towards the left. Although the centre companies made comparatively good progress, the left company, under Captain Parbury, which was guarding the left flank, was facing a torrent of Japanese fire. Here the Australians were without armoured support, and although they had reached the new strip in less than an hour, clearing several bunkers, their losses were heavy, some 46 men in the first hour of fighting. They had reached their target position, but were pinned by murderous machine gun fire from a line of bunkers and needed armoured support to make any further advance. However, the tanks were not having an easy time. Although the Japanese lacked anti-tank weapons in this area, they were still inflicting casualties. Captain Whitehead, a tank troop commander, was peering through his vision slit as he was engaging a line of bunkers when he saw the muzzle of a light machine gun and a bright flash. A brave Japanese soldier had boarded the tank and fired into the vision slit, hitting Whitehead in the head. After killing the brave Japanese soldier, the supporting infantry pulled the captain from the tank, alive but blind in one eye. By 1pm, the Australians had gained almost a thousand metres on the right and were beginning to flank around the main defensive line on the new strip. The greatest concentration of bunkers, 16 of them, were at the far end of the new strip a complex which had inflicted such murderous casualties on the 32nd Division. Here, the far left company was still pinned by machine gun fire, as it had been since 8am. Finally relieved by a tank troop and reserve company, Captain Porbury conferred with the tank troop commander. He would advance with a section between each tank, and his lead elements would fire flares at any bunkers they had identified. At 2 o'clock, the attack on the left began. As the tanks advanced, the Japanese bunker line bristled with automatic fire. But as soon as a bunker was identified, the flares went down range, followed by 37mm rounds. As the pillboxes were made of coconut palm logs, some began to catch fire. As they burned, the Japanese finally cracked, broke, and fled to the rear. By 3pm, 11 bunkers had been taken along the strip, and of the remaining 5, the Japanese had fled. Finally, after 6 weeks of fighting, the new strip had been cleared. 
By nightfall, the Australians had achieved their Phase 1 objectives. Though they had started facing north, they were now facing west, and had cleared the whole Europa plantation to Cape and Deirere. It was easily the most significant gains made in the entire battle, but it had come at a heavy cost. 11 officers and 160 men killed or wounded, more than a third of their strength. Dozens of bunkers had been cleared, and it was obvious that the tanks were worth their weight in gold. Combined arms warfare, as much as the high fighting spirit and technical skill of the infantry, had been a key to this successful attack. By the night of the 20th of December, the Allies were in possession of the whole area to the rear of the old and new strips. The 2nd Ninth had reached the Simemi Creek, with the 3rd Battalion of the 128th Regiment moving up on their left. The American and Australian battalions had now cleared the entire plantation and were behind the Japanese defences along the old strip. Spearheading the clearance of this bunker line was the 2nd 10th Battalion, which took the bridge between the old and new strips with surprising ease. Under fire, the bridge was rapidly repaired by a very brave and capable 2nd Lieutenant James E. Doherty. As has been evidenced all throughout 1942, the feats of American engineers in the theatre were critical and are often underappreciated. The second phase attack went in on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve. With four tanks in support and one in reserve, the only serviceable vehicles left, the second tenth began rolling up the defences from the Japanese left wing, starting at the end of the old strip and moving along it. The Japanese were without heavy anti-tank equipment, and thus far the light steward tanks had been relatively immune to Japanese infantry. However, guarding the old ship were a number of anti-aircraft guns. The Australian tank commanders were worried about these weapons, but as they had been inactive for weeks, some supposed that they had been knocked out by the heavy artillery barrage. As the attack went in, with the four tanks supported by infantry, the concealed weapon opened fire. The Type 26 25mm autocannon was more than capable of penetrating the Stuart's thin front armour plate, and within five minutes, all of the Australian tanks were knocked out. So the Australians, now deprived of their trump card, had to engage the murderous strongpoints unsupported. By nightfall, they had gained about 500 yards towards the Boona mission, but a good chunk of the old strip defences were still intact. Clearing these without armour would be a tough and deadly business. In two days of fighting, the Australian and American battalions made slow but steady progress. Taking Japanese bunkers often took immense courage. In the centre of the old strip, one position was taking a murderous toll on the Australian infantry which were carefully approaching. It took the bravery of Private Hughes, an indigenous Australian who, disdainful of death, charged the bunker alone. Somehow, the five gunners missed him, whom he rapidly killed with a grenade, clearing the position. The same luck would not hold for a young Sergeant Delmar Daniels of the Michigan National Guard. With his platoon pinned by the murderous fire of a bunker at the end of the old strip, Sergeant Daniels charged the machine gun alone. He was killed just metres in front of it. Such was the courage this kind of fighting demanded. The combat over these days was the story of several small assaults, often made under the cover of smoke, against individual bunkers, the Americans on the left flank, the Australians on the right. In these desperate battles, there are too many episodes of individual courage to mention. After the loss of the tanks, the Australians decided to use their artillery in a direct fire role. One of these devastating weapons, called Freddy One, was brought up to the front line under the cover of darkness. As the weapon picked off bunkers with armor-piercing rounds, it ended up in a protracted two-day duel with a Japanese 25mm anti-aircraft gun. The two weapons were effectively sniping at each other in a battle that became personal for the Australian gun crew. Like two snipers, stalking each other in the rubble of Stalingrad, the Australian and Japanese gunners desperately tried to locate and eliminate one another. The Australians claimed they killed the enemy gun crew three times, only to have other brave Japanese men man the weapon until it was finally silenced. The gun was laid so accurately, and the range was so close, that the weapon could target individual Japanese soldiers. The Australian official history preserves the recollection of one of the gunners. The deadly accuracy of the laying gave the OPO the power of life and death over any individual Jap seen in the target area. Lieutenant Handron Smith, the OPO, would sometimes nominate his targets. When the Japs were withdrawing from the pillboxes on the far side of the strip, Handron Smith spied a Japanese giving orders to a couple of his men. The officer, or NCO, stopped momentarily in a short, shallow trench. This trench had been accurately registered 
and many Japs had been killed in its locality by direct hits. Said the OPO, I nominate that bloke for the next round. Orders were quickly passed to the gun, and all eyes were on the Jap. When the 25-pounder fired, the Jap appeared to sense that the round was meant for him. He jumped onto the parapet with the idea of making a dash. Foolish move. The onlookers assert that the shell hit him in the pit of the stomach. At all events, he disappeared in instant disintegration. Apparently, this incredible story was corroborated by the supporting infantry. Nevertheless, as this very slow progress was being made at the old strip, solid gains were being achieved towards Boona Government Station. By the 27th, two companies, one American and one Australian, were moving west unopposed along the coastal track. Much had been achieved after Wooten's arrival. Most of the area of Japanese resistance facing Warren Force had been cleared, including the bunkers around the old strip, but the veteran 2nd 9th and 2nd 10th battalions had suffered dearly. With the deployment of the 18th Brigade's 3rd Battalion and another squadron of tanks, the final phase of operations began. In a series of methodical attacks, the 2nd 12th Battalion and 3rd Battalion of the 128th Regiment, supported by a squadron of Australian Stuart tanks, reduced the final area of resistance towards Jeropa Point. By New Year's Day 1943, Wooten had achieved all of his objectives. Warren Force was finally victorious. The achievement of the Americans and Australians of Warren Force was substantial. The Japanese force manning the left flank defences numbered around 2,500 men, including the crack 3rd Battalion of the 229th Regiment, under the indefatigable Colonel Yamamoto. These men enjoyed the protection of extraordinarily strong defences, a network of interlocking bunker lines dominating the cleared areas of the airstrips and arranged in considerable depth. In addition to these fortifications, the Japanese had four 3-inch naval guns, two mountain guns, two 37mm guns, and numerous 25mm weapons. The Japanese position had been constructed with the utmost technical skill, and had been manned by Japanese forces that had showed themselves to be of very high quality. But by the 2nd of January, Colonel Yamamoto's whole force had been utterly destroyed. The Allies buried over 900 bodies, although, obviously, Japanese casualties would have been far heavier than this. As Wooten was leading Warren Force to victory, Eichelberger took personal command of Urbana Force. His objective was Buna Government Station. After all, he had been ordered to take Buna or not come back alive. He had been reinforced by the 32nd Division's last regiment, the 127th, but the Japanese defences here were still as formidable as they had proven to be in November. The area of the Triangle, ground where so many brave young Americans had fallen, was still in enemy hands. The 126th Regiment had made some progress through the putrid swamp on the left flank, and after testing the defences at the Triangle, Eichelberger decided to shift the main thrust of his attacks there. Through the swamp, the Americans were able to make slow but steady progress in an area between the Triangle and Musita Island. Nonetheless, the lead elements were flanked by strong Japanese opposition. Tomlinson, still in command of Urbana Force, had planned to use the new regiment in a pair of attacks from the 18th of December, which Eichelberger approved. First, he would move against the left flank at the island, then the next day against the Triangle. Spearheaded by Captain Westland's company of the 3rd Battalion, 127th Regiment, the Americans advanced through the swamp. As they approached the bridge, the lead elements were ambushed by well-concealed Japanese, and Westland was killed, along with most of his senior officers. Thrown into confusion, the company withdrew. With the first attack repulsed, Tomlinson turned against the Triangle. Preceded by a heavy mortar barrage and heavy bomber airstrike on the Buna government station, two companies attacked the Triangle from the Coconut Grove under the command of Captain Boyce. They were stopped cold in the face of interlocking machine gun fire, sustaining 40 casualties, including Boyce. On the next day, the 2nd Battalion of the 127th attacked the Triangle from the south, but this made no impression for the loss of another 39 killed and wounded. This episode was too much for Colonel Tomlinson. Exhausted by a month of operations in front of Buna, he asked to be relieved of command. After conferring with General Herring, Eichelberger decided to try and bypass the Triangle. There was little choice as there was no chance that armour could be deployed in this section given the swampy ground. The strength of the 127th Regiment was just being expended pointlessly trying to reduce it. Instead, he would shift the main thrust of Urbana Force to the corridor between the main Japanese defences with forces deployed on either flank to contain them. His goal was Buna Government Station, about a thousand metres from his start positions, which lay on the other side of some dry ground called the Government Plantation. The attack went in on Christmas Eve. 
As had been the case all throughout the battle, the American mortars were used with great effect. They employed an elaborate and heavy fire plan. Behind the rolling barrage, the guardsmen advanced. In the center, they were held by machine gun fire, but on the left wing, one platoon broke through to the sea. As it edged into the plantation, it was halted by two strong points. Alone, Sergeant Kenneth E. Grunert charged the two Japanese positions, using grenades to silence the first gun, killing its crew. Though wounded, he charged the second, driving its occupants out into the open with grenades, where the rest of the platoon mowed them down, before he was killed by a rifle shot. Sergeant Grunert received the Medal of Honor for his bravery and his sacrifice. Although some progress was made on the left, Grunert's platoon was unsupported and driven back by a Japanese counterattack. The advance on the 24th had ended in confusion, but Eichelberger ordered a renewed effort on Christmas Day. Masked by a heavy mortar attack on the left wing, two companies began silently moving through the plantation. They made good ground against scant opposition before they were engaged by the Japanese reserve that had been lured to the left flank by the mortar bombardment. They were just 600 meters from Buna government station. But the Japanese counterattacked fiercely and the two companies were encircled. For the next two days, a confused battle was fought as several companies tried to break the encirclement. The forward units, out of communication with the rest of the force, were deteriorating rapidly. As he later recollected, on the 27th, Eichelberger was growing increasingly concerned about his position. I was to explore the depths of depression. On the night of the 27th of December, at 2 a.m., a conference took place in my tent. We heard the reports, and they were grave all right. Our troops, if the reports were to be credited, were suffering from battle shock and had become incapable of advance. A number of my senior officers were convinced the situation was desperate. I think I said, as I had said before, let us not take counsel of our fears. Nevertheless, I was thoroughly alarmed. The 32nd Division was, indeed, in very poor shape. On the 31st of December, Colonel Gross, the new commander of Urbana Force, had to personally intervene to prevent the rout of a company. Under the command of Captain Bragg, the company was attacking along the coast when Bragg was killed in the first engagement. Gross then heard from his forward observer that a lieutenant had assumed command and was leading the whole company to the rear. The colonel, later recounting the scene, met them on the track. So I placed myself on the trail over which I knew they would have to come, and, pistol in hand, I stopped the lieutenant and all those following him. I directed the lieutenant to return and he said that he couldn't. I asked him if he knew what that meant, and he said he did. The first sergeant was wounded, and I therefore let him proceed to the dressing station. I designated a sergeant nearby to take the men back and he did so. I then sent the lieutenant to the rear in arrest and under guard. Despite Eichelberger's fears, the Americans were making progress. By the 28th, they had broken through to the two surrounded companies in the government plantation, and by small advances, they were pushing the Japanese back, one bite at a time. By New Year's Day, they were ready for the final advance. The Japanese garrison, which had fought so resolutely throughout the battle, showed signs that they were finally breaking. Men began to swim for safety by the dozen. Many were shot down in the water. Eager to link up with Wooten's advancing forces along the coast, Eichelberger ordered the main attack for the 2nd of January. Although the Japanese were clearly broken, the guardsmen still had a hard day's fighting ahead. In a column of three companies, the Americans advanced through the coconut grove, and by 3 p.m. they came upon the cratered wasteland that was once the Buna government station. Small pockets of Japanese resistance continued to take their toll, and squads and platoons were forced to rout out stubborn Japanese positions with grenades. But by the end of the day, the 32nd Division was finally in occupation of Buna government station. On the right wing, before nightfall, the advancing 127th Regiment made contact with the Australian 2nd 9th Battalion, linking Warren and Urbana forces. Finally, six weeks after the first attack, Buna had fallen. The Japanese had fought a brilliant defensive battle before Buna. Well over a division had been thrown against the defences, some four regiments or brigades. Buna had cost the Allies 2,870 battle casualties. A disproportionately high number of these combat casualties were Australian, some 913 men or just under a third, showing how much the battle had turned on their intervention. This point is only underlined by the fact that the Australians were only in combat for around two weeks in this sector. Japanese casualties are unknown. 1,390 Japanese bodies were found, but total casualties were far more, 
There are Japanese reports that hundreds of men were buried alive in their bunkers during a single air raid on the 7th of December. As the Americans closed in on the 28th, Japanese 8th Fleet Command received the last communication from the Buna garrison. The garrison is being gradually destroyed by concentrated enemy fire. Our troops repeatedly mount counterattacks, often inflicting heavy casualties on the Allies in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Our assessment of the overall situation is that we will be able to hold the garrison until tomorrow morning. On reflection, in over 40 days of battle, all the men, whether Navy personnel or laborers, have given all that could be asked of them. Our gratitude to our commanders and the support of Navy, Air and Surface Forces is boundless. We pray for the prosperity of our Imperial land far away and for lasting success in battle for all. Japanese sources indicate that about 350 men escaped from the total force of 2,500. The Buna garrison had been utterly destroyed, but it had not been defeated cheaply. As battle raged along the Gona Buna front in Rabaul, the new 18th Army commander, General Adachi, was advocating a new policy. It was clear that holding the Buna front was both unwise and probably untenable, as Allied air power staged from Port Moresby was becoming crushing. It was clear that the defensive operations to the southwest of Rabaul had to be focused on the north coast of New Guinea. The Japanese would concentrate on holding the bases of Salamaua and Leh, and to facilitate this new posture, the 51st Division was being deployed to the area. With the anchorage at Gona lost, there was no hope of landing reinforcements as planned, and without relief, the whole South Seas detachment, what was left of it anyway, would simply be destroyed. Although Japanese generals were certainly not above sacrificing their forces, these men would be of better utility in the Battle of Salamaua and Leh, which Adachi knew would come. The Imperial General Headquarters agreed, and issued orders that all Japanese forces in the Buna area to withdraw to Salamaua when possible. Nonetheless, they had to survive long enough to withdraw. With Gona and Buna now taken by the Allies, pressure on the final Japanese position around Sanananda began to intensify. Along the track itself, Brigadier Porter's 30th Brigade was still pressed hard against the nearly impregnable defences. Porter had no confidence in two of his Australian militia battalions, the 36th and 53rd 55th, which had performed so poorly along the Kokoda track. His best battalion, the 49th, had been placed under the command of the 21st Brigade. Doherty's 21st Brigade had been transferred from the Gona sector, and the Americans were finally relieved at Huggins Roadblock by the 39th Battalion. However, there was growing disagreement over how to proceed. By the 20th of December, two additional battalions had been deployed along the track, but their commitment had not achieved anything decisive. The 2nd 7th Cavalry Regiment, equivalent to an infantry battalion, outflanked the Japanese positions in a repeat of the tactics employed thus far, establishing a new position and cutting the track behind the Japanese defences. But again, just as the establishment of the Huggins roadblock by the Americans had demonstrated in November, these maneuvers still left strong Japanese positions in the rear of your forward forces. At this point, MacArthur directed Blamey to deploy the 163rd Regimental Combat Team to the front at San Ananda. A third of the 41st Division, the Americans rated this unit to be of substantially higher quality and combat readiness than the 32nd. Blamey was unhappy about this micromanagement and interference, which was surely driven by MacArthur's concern for American prestige rather than military necessity. The 163rd was one of the only fresh reserves left, and it may well have been of greater use elsewhere rather than being wasted against the formidable defences along the San Ananda track. Herring had ordered the 7th Division to continue advancing down the track whilst the 32nd would move from Buna along the coast. Vassy decided to place his two fresh American battalions in the two roadblocks and focus all of the available firepower on the forward Japanese positions, which were to be attacked by the 30th and 21st Brigades. The newly arrived Americans were eager for battle, and Colonel Doe asked Vassy for permission to lead one of the newly arrived battalions against the main defences. The Australian agreed. On the 8th of January, Doe attacked with three companies from the west of the main defences along the track. The Americans gained a first taste of the quality of their Japanese opponents, who did not retreat a single yard. Sobered by the colossal task which faced them, Doe agreed with the initial plan and moved his forces into blocking positions. Throughout the 10th and 11th of January, the Australians probed the defences, but these were as formidable as ever. On the 12th, the whole 18th Brigade assailed the defences with heavy artillery support, but only made minor gains. General Vassy was now questioning the wisdom of attacking the main defences along the track, 
advocating instead for the primary thrust to be made in the coastal sector. He outlined these concerns to General Herring. As a result of the attack by 18th Australian Infantry Brigade on the 12th of January 1943, it is now clear that the present position which has been held by the Jap since the 20th of November 1942 consists of a series of perimeter localities in which there are numerous pillboxes of the same type as those found in the Boona area. To attack these with infantry using their own weapons is repeating the costly mistakes of 1915 to 1917. And, in view of the limited resources which can be, at present, put into the field in this area, such attacks seem unlikely to succeed. The nature of the ground prevents the use of tanks except along the main San Ananda track, on which the enemy has already shown that he has anti-tank guns capable of knocking out the M3 light tank. Owing to the denseness of the undergrowth in the area of ops, these pillboxes are only discovered at very short range, in all cases under 100 yards, and it is therefore not possible to subject them to RT bombardment without withdrawing our own troops. Experience has shown that when our troops are withdrawn to permit such a bombardment, the Jap occupies the vacated territory, so that bombardment, apart from doing him little damage, only produces new positions out of which the Jap must be driven. However, on the 13th, Vassi's concerns evaporated. A prisoner captured during the attack revealed that the Japanese were withdrawing, leaving only sick and wounded to man the defences. Australian patrols also noted the lack of Japanese resistance. By the 14th, Vassi ordered Wooten, now transferred from the Buna sector, to advance with speed and drive on the coast. Moving down the neighbouring Killerton track, Wooten's men had reached Cape Killerton by the 15th. With Australians now established to the west of San Ananda and the Americans to the east, the Japanese position was being squeezed from three sides. The remaining Japanese forces were ordered to move to the mouth of the Kamusi River. Several hundred were evacuated by barge on the night of the 20th, but most simply took to the swamps. Because of the nature of the terrain, the Allied positions were widely dispersed, and thousands simply walked through Allied lines. By the 23rd of January, only about 300 had arrived at the Kamusi, but in all, some 3,700 Japanese men would survive the battle. This force would then be withdrawn to the Salamau and Lay bases. On the 22nd, after days of bitter fighting with ferocious Japanese rearguard forces, Allied elements had taken the Japanese base areas at Jirua, including their hospital. Although mopping up operations continued for some time, the Battle of Buna and Gona was over. This horrendous battle, fought in putrid mangrove swamp and malaria-infested jungle, was certainly an Allied victory, but it was paid for in gallons of Allied blood. The Japanese, especially along the San Ananda track, had performed miracles. As the Australian official history notes, here the Japanese forces, exhausted from months of mountain fighting, starving, and only supplied by the most tenuous lines of communication, had held both the Australians and the Americans impotent for two months. It was not just the nearly inexhaustible Japanese fighting spirit that made them so formidable in defence, but their skill. The entrenchments that had been constructed all along the Gona Buna front, mostly made of simple local materials such as palm trees, were as formidable as any built in the Great War. Placed with skill, Constructed stoutly and defended to the last man, the nightmare of bunkers and pillboxes had consumed thousands of brave Allied lives. Almost three Allied divisions had been thrown against the defences, only to be consumed by machine gun and swamp. None of the formations engaged in the front would be battle-worthy for months. Since the Japanese invasion of Papua had begun, between the 22nd of July 1942 and the 22nd of January 1943, they had inflicted 8,546 casualties on the Allies, killed, wounded or missing. One could definitely consider the fighting along the San Ananda track to be a Japanese defensive victory, but with their flanks crushed it was only a matter of time before they succumbed to the Allies. Defeating an enemy of such high quality occupying such strong positions in nightmarish country required countless acts of individual bravery, only a handful of which have been recounted here. The Japanese had shown themselves to be, perhaps, the best defensive fighters in the world, at least at the tactical level, and allied training, doctrine, and even fundamental strategy would have to be adapted to this startling new reality. Almost as a rule, Japanese soldiers would fight to the death, even when thoroughly beaten, and the toll they would take in allied lives would be unsustainable if they were fought wherever they were. Nevertheless, several allied advantages were beginning to tell. Allied air superiority had choked off reinforcements, and even without substantial allied naval forces, 
the Japanese were unable to operate warships in the forward area by day. The Japanese leaders had fought with determination, if not great amounts of tactical skill. Colonel Yamamoto Hiroshi, Major Yamamoto Tsunichi, and Lieutenant Colonel Tsukamoto Hatsuo are all Japanese officers who fought with bravery and tenacity. Major General Oda, the South Seas Detachment commander during this period, tried to exert his influence on the battle, but there was really not much he could do once his forces were engaged by the Allies. After he had ensured that the surviving elements had crossed the Kamusi River, Oda committed suicide. Major General Oda, much like his predecessor, Major General Horii, and 12,000 other Japanese men met their end in Papua during 1942. The vast majority of the approximately 18,000 who were deployed there, the South Seas Detachment now existed in name alone. MacArthur had, again, showed his limitations. Although the fundamental concept which underpinned the operational plan was sound, good in fact, when put under a microscope, it was revealed to be poor in execution. The Allies achieved material superiority at Buna and Gona by rapidly concentrating two divisions against one, but these were so poorly supported that their attacks immediately bogged down. Throwing lone infantry battalions against a well-fortified base, one which had been in Japanese hands for five months, was foolhardy. His rapid, sweeping movements, which look so good on operational maps, are useless if the logistical infrastructure is not in place to support them. Thus. When your men go into battle, they do so without artillery or armor. His selection of the 32nd Division for the operation is hard to comprehend. It was manifestly, obviously, not ready for this kind of fighting. As MacArthur had stated, the unit was selected because of its nationality, not because it was the most suitable for the task. Even amongst the American forces, the 41st Division was thought to be of substantially higher quality. But its performance at Buna had nothing to do with its nationality, as some historians have argued, but simply its level of preparation and training. The Australian Army had an internal grading system based on the quantity and quality of training a unit had received, and the 32nd was almost certainly a C-rated division, fit for static defence only. It needed much more detailed training and exercises before it could be expected to assault well-entrenched Japanese formations. Its jungle warfare training was practically non-existent, and as is evident in numerous episodes, such as the abandonment of radio equipment, the men often lacked physical fitness, the most basic element of military training. If a C or D-rated Australian division was thrown against the Japanese defences at Buna without overwhelming fire support, there is no reason to think it would have fared any better. Although there are countless episodes of individual heroism displayed by brave soldiers and NCOs of the 32nd Division, the unit as a whole lacked cohesion, discipline, and commitment. Indeed, there are several episodes which approached mutiny. These fighting qualities do not magically appear because a unit happens to be American, Australian, British, or Japanese. They are built through thorough and intense training and preparation. This is especially true of the junior officer and NCO corps, which are effectively the unit's backbone. The Australians had made the same mistake by deploying inadequately trained militia battalions along the Kokoda track. Rather than toughening them up, this not only wasted lives but endangered the whole Australian position in the mountains. Historically, Harding has been the scapegoat for the performance of the 32nd Division, but arguably MacArthur is just as much to blame. At the very least, it needed armour, but even if the tanks had been available, as was evident throughout the battle, the infantry may have struggled to support them in the face of devastating machine gun fire. The unit lacked the discipline, morale, and esprit de corps required to reliably advance on defences such as these, and these qualities take time to build. Unprepared and poorly supported, it was the young guardsmen who lost their lives in the swamps around Buna who ultimately paid the price for these poor decisions. Obviously, men die in war, but needless sacrifice is always a tragedy and the 32nd Division had suffered well over a thousand battle casualties without making any impression on the nearly impregnable defences. Poorly equipped for jungle operations and poorly supplied, the swamps began to drain their number as quickly as the Japanese. MacArthur's ridiculous orders to advance regardless of losses or take Buna or not come back alive, like he was starring in some B-grade Hollywood movie, ring all the more hollow given the nightmare into which he had thrown the 32nd. All too quick to criticise the fighting quality of Australian units at Milne Bay and during the Kokoda campaign, the American experience at Buna was a rude awakening for MacArthur. Clearly, 
he had underestimated both the Japanese and the Australian forces under his command. The pick of the Allied generals was undoubtedly Lieutenant General Eichelberger, the US First Corps commander. Confronted by an absolute mess at Buna, he did everything he could to improve a very challenging situation. Obviously dealt a bad hand through calm and consistent leadership, a cool adherence to military discipline, and displays of personal bravery, Eichelberger averted an impending disaster. He integrated seamlessly with his Australian colleagues, and it was through the team that he quickly forged with General Herring, and especially Brigadier General Wooten, that the gruelling battle around Buna was successfully brought to a close. Professional, competent, and tactically sound, respected by his men and well-liked by his allies, Eichelberger is certainly an underappreciated name in American military history. The Australian generals had performed well enough, although, perhaps understandably, Vassy seemed confounded by the situation along the San Ananda track. Wooten's command of Warren Force was good. His battle plan was sound and well executed, but given his vast experience and the quality of the 18th Brigade he led, this should probably be expected. The conclusion of fighting on the Gona Buna front in January 1943 marked somewhat of a turning point in the Pacific War, the end of one chapter and the beginning of another. When the 8th Area Army issued its orders for the evacuation of the Buna garrison, it simultaneously ordered the withdrawal of all Japanese forces from Guadalcanal. The two fronts in the Pacific War, Papua and Guadalcanal, had long been raging in unison, and their simultaneous conclusion, almost exactly a year after the war had begun, certainly marked an end to this phase of the conflict. The Allies were, well and truly, on the offensive. Although the major striking power of the Southwest Pacific area had been badly bruised in and around Buna, the 9th Australian Division, fresh from their victory at El Alamein, was heading back to Australia, and within six months, MacArthur's forces would be ready for another major offensive, this time on a greater scale. By June 1943, Operation Cartwheel, one of MacArthur's best concepts, would be in action, and simultaneous Australian and American offensives in New Guinea and the Solomon Islands would encircle the great Japanese fortress at Rabaul. However, the Australians already had pressing matters to attend to. In New Guinea, Okabe Detachment, a regimental combat unit of the 51st Division, veterans of the Sino-Japanese War, were closing in on a group of Australian commandos in the Bololo Valley. Based out of the small mountain airfield at Wau, the only Allied position on the whole north coast of New Guinea, the commandos of Kanga Force were threatened with imminent destruction. The race to defend Wau had begun, and here the Japanese would make their last land offensive in the southwest Pacific area.